G'day everyone, uh, welcome to uh, Tell Me Something That We Don't Know, a uh, conversation, a serious chat with a comedian. Uh, my guest this week is a gentleman who's played soccer for Australia. He was the first Australian player to not only score a goal in the Liga, the Premier League in Serie A, but play in all leagues, all those three leagues at the same time, well not at the same time, but over his career. Uh, he's, uh, he ended up being a, a coach for the A-League, as a family man, surprisingly recently also underwent open heart surgery, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, he's a friend of mine from a long time. But my next guest, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is probably best known for scoring the goal that stopped the nation. Yes, that goal, the goal that uh, got Australia into the World Cup in uh, Europe for when they played Uruguay in 2005. And he will be forever cemented in the minds of Australians by owning what the Australian Sports Commission voted as one of the top three sporting moments in our country's sporting history. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Mr. John Aloisi. Hi, John. Thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me on. No worries, mate. Now, before you played soccer, you played cricket, didn't you? Yeah, I did play cricket. Oh, well, I played both of them. It was cricket in summer and uh, soccer in winter. And, um, you know, I used to play a lot with my brother in the in the backyard and, uh, and also in the drive. My old man was a good cricketer. Really? And, and I, yeah, my old man. Funny enough, I don't know how he took up cricket, but yeah. uh, he, he was a, he was a mean, fast bowler. So I tried to uh, copy him, but um, I only played until about twelve, thirteen years old. Right, because you see a lot of um, you see a lot of people in the AFL, uh, rugby, and soccer, obviously with Italian names, but you never see in Australian cricket anyone with an Italian surname. Do you know why that is? I don't know why that is. There was only one player that I remember. His name was Joe Scuderi. He played in uh, South Australia. Right. And I used to follow him because he had an Italian background. Right. But, you know, so, I figured it out because we, my brother and I used to love playing cricket. Yeah. But I look back and I go, why didn't we pursue it? And, and I, and I realise now, John, I don't know if your dad did the same thing. Do you remember when kids, we'd buy um, the, the bat and the ball and stumps? Yeah. The stumps would also go missing. They would always go missing. And where were they? Mole man used to use them to tie tomatoes around them. <laughs> <laughs> and and then the little bales, right? You think, oh, where you know, they've got to be somewhere. No, he used to tie spare spare string around the bales. <laughs> that's that's why I reckon there were never any Italians in cricket. <laughs> you know what? You've probably got a point there because I think my grandfather used to steal our cricket stumps because he used to do the he used to be the one growing the tomatoes with, right. the, with the cricket stumps. So it probably you got a good point, Joe. I reckon I'm right there. Anyway, so <laughs> getting off the topic. So you, you started cricket. So you're playing soccer at the same time. But when did you really start to um, explore that or, or know that you're a much better soccer player than a cricket player? Um, I think it was when I was about 14. Yeah. We went to the Australian National Championships, which, uh, like, I was playing for South Australia. We played right. against Victoria, New South Wales, and yeah. um, that was down in Tasmania. And um, I ended up becoming leading goal scorer of the of the competition. And I thought, oh, I, I'm not bad at this. You know, I can score some goals. And, uh, and that's when I really believed that I could actually uh, try and pursue it and make a career out of it. And, uh, and one day play professional soccer because back then it was only semi-professional here in Australia but yep. my dream was to go play overseas so that's when I probably started to realise I needed to really focus on soccer. How old were you at the time though? I was 14 years old. So you yeah. were 14 and you were the lead goal scorer in yeah. that, in that it, of that competition so all the best players in that uh, age group were in, in this national championship and uh, and so you know, I start to think, well, I'm the best or well, one of the best strikers of my age group. That yep. uh, I've got a good opportunity of, uh, of you know, trying to, to be, you know, one of the best in Australia when I get older. And, um, and, and my brother at the time as well was starting to get selected for the under-17 national team. Right. Um, so it, it was good to have Ross, my older brother, he's three yep. years older than me, yep. um, because he always pushed me even without him realising because right. I wanted to be better than him, whether we're playing, you know, uh, yeah. cricket in the backyard or soccer or, or whatever, you know, it was always a competition between my brother and, and myself and it would end up in fights as well. <laughs> I'm sure it would. So here's an interesting point, something that I never thought of before, but now that you mentioned it, what, why do you think that there are famous brothers or famous sisters, you know, who uh, play soccer? Or like, let's look at tennis. You know, you've got the, the Williams sisters. 
yeah. you know, I mean, it's 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 amazing that one of those women ended up being a, one of the greatest. But both sisters. I mean, it's it's very it's very rare, isn't it? How, why do you think that that sort of thing happens? I mean, was your dad was he a great soccer player that, of course, it naturally flowed yeah. onto you guys? What do you yeah, reckon? And, and my dad wasn't a great soccer player. He might tell us different, but he <laughs> uh, he didn't play at any sort of level. But he was a he was a coach, and so he coached right. us when we we're growing right. up. Um, and and he he made it hard for us because whenever we played in his teams, mm -hmm. we had to be better than everyone else because. My old man used to say, if you're not better, I can't play you. Right. So we, we used to train harder and work harder. and um, But I think what it is is that you drive each other. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you're always trying to uh, be better than, you know, your sibling. Um, and, and we were able to then, you know, if we had time uh, at home that we weren't doing anything, you know, we'll be out in the backyard kicking the ball around. So, you know, you spend hours doing that and, and you improve as, uh, by doing that. So I, I think that's why siblings can also look in, in Adelaide as well. You had the Vidmar brothers who... Right, yeah, of um, course. Aurelio yeah, Aurelio and Tony. And Tony yeah. yeah, and so yeah. they ended up playing for the national team and, uh, you know, going back years, there were the Neskohus brothers, also South Australian. So right. it, it happens quite a bit in sport. And I yeah. think that's the reason why, because you're able to... to train with each other all the time it's not even training it's, it's virtually uh, street football but in your backyard yeah great well, okay that's a really, really interesting point there okay so here you are leading goal scorer what happens next who notices you someone's got to say oh geez this kid's really good who, who's that and where do you go from there well first of all it was you know i went back to my club adelaide city mm -hmm. um so i played adelaide city since uh, i started playing soccer when i was five for a local team ingle yeah. farm but they were the only yeah, club that would accept five years old, uh, yeah. five year olds back then. So then, when I was seven years old, I went to Adelaide City and playing the under tens. Mm -hmm. um, that's an Italian club. And then I was playing at Adelaide City, and um, my old man was the youth team coach, and but also right. the um, he was a state league coach. And so the state league and the and the youth team used to sort of coincide. But the the state league was open age, so uh, to put it. In simple terms, you had the first team and then you had the state league, which is the second team. Yeah. Um, and uh, one day my old man came back from, from work and I was kicking the ball outside. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I've got no players tomorrow for the state league side because all of them had to play in the youth league. He goes, are you ready to play? And I thought he was joking because yeah. I was only a kid, 14 yeah. years old yeah. and uh, yeah. all these growing ups and, you know, and... Um, and I said, well, are you, are you serious? He goes, yeah, yeah. And uh, so no pressure. You're starting as well. You're not even on the bench. <laughs> yeah, right. And, um, so I went and played in this game. And the yeah. first team coach, Zoran Matic, happened to be there. Right. And I played a good game. And he said to, to my dad, I know he's your son. Yeah. But he's good enough to play. So you have to play him. And he's training with the first team from now on. So at 14 years old, I started training with the, the National League side, the A-League side, yeah. uh, with Zoran Matic. So that's when I first got noticed. Right, okay. Yeah, and, and you would have had, they would have been, your dad would have had to sort of think, well, you know, is anyone going to think, oh, I'm favouring my son in a bit of nepotism there? So did they, did they have a problem with that or not really? Uh, not really, because I was doing better than the others. So, yeah. uh, but you always have it. You know, yeah. I remember one game, and and my old man, he's he's a tough person, as you yeah. know yeah. what all the old Italians yeah. are like. Yeah. Uh, don't tell him I told him he was old because he he'll get upset. <laughs> he actually looks better than me. He looks younger than me. I've got a dad like that. My dad looks like George Clooney. <laughs> he's got a lot more hair. More girls look at him than me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So um, I remember one game he had me on the bench and uh, this player uh, was starting in my position mm -hmm. and um, he brought him off after 30 minutes and, and in soccer that's very early to bring yeah. a player yeah. off yeah. And, uh, and he said make sure you go on and do well because you know if not we're going to get a lot of questions thrown at yeah. us and uh, yeah. so that was the pressure he would put on me but I look back now and go well that, that actually helped me it, it made me tougher because yep. my dad was a coach I had to be you know understand there was going to be criticism thrown at me but yep. I had to deal with it and then that made me that helped me deal with it yeah right and w when did you go to the Australian Institute of Sport yeah I went there at the age of 16 yep. um, and uh, that was very like 
that was great for, for not only me, for the players around, because <laughs> around our age group, we had Mark Viduka that was there, Josip Skoko, Craig Moore. That's just to name a few that yeah. ended up playing at a yeah. very high level. So you're training and playing with the best. And when you yeah. can do that, you're improving at a faster rate. Um, yeah. And plus we had good coaches in Ron Smith and Steve O'Connor. And, and uh, so they helped us at our game a lot. Um, and, you know, and also the big thing was, was leaving home because it was Canberra, but it was still not with your family. So yeah. that, that also prepared us to, to get ready to go overseas when it was our time to go overseas. Right. And who was going to cook your dog's pasta? <laughs> <laughs> who was going to who was going to wash your clothes and iron your shirts? No one's well, going to do it like mum was going to do. No, nah, well, you know what? I used to wear uh, shirts that were creased. <laughs> uh, I, my uh, most of my clothes would stink, but yeah. uh, we we used to we used to like um, obviously get someone to help us with that sort of stuff. But yeah. I was a very much an Italian boy that didn't do anything <laughs> at home. Didn't yeah. even know how to make my bed. <laughs> um, so yeah. it, that was a, that was an eye opener, and yeah. uh, but we had a couple of other uh, you know Italian boys that were in yeah. the in the group, and uh, so every now and then you'd get a shipment of uh, homemade Italian sausages. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So and, that was good nights. There was no uh, there was no nutrition coaches back then. You had to sneak, <laughs> you had to sneak in a tray of lasagna. Carbs weren't the best for you. Well, we did have a nutrition coach. So yeah. we, we, we all had to go in the food hall. And yeah, that was right. supposed to be like nutritionists yeah. for us and, and, yeah. and whatever else. But yeah. don't worry, the Italian sausages, uh, they still got in there. Yeah. It's like a, 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 a Italian guys who go to jail. You know, there's always someone sneaking in some salamis <laughs> and prosciutto. <laughs> anyway, so um, so you, you now I, I read somewhere that you used to sleep with the soccer ball when you yeah. At, up until what age? <laughs> oh, I don't even know what age, but uh, I reckon it would have been at least, you know, probably 12. Yeah, right. I used to, I used to dream about playing soccer all the time. So mm-hmm. soccer was, it was obviously a passion. Yeah. It was, um, I used to watch Serie A uh, on, on Sundays on SBS. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you just used to dream about going there and playing there in the Serie yeah. A. And, um, and, because you you know you always used to uh, be kicking the ball around and, and loving the game you know i used to bring my soccer ball to bed with me because it, it just used to come with me everywhere so <laughs> it was one of those things that um you know i, I don't know why i did it but uh, yeah. I, I i did it i remember yeah well obviously it helped now you used to dream about getting to the city r you did get to the city r so let's start that journey so so what happens there so you're really good in australia right how did you get go from australia to Europe. So from the Institute of Sport, I went yeah. back to Adelaide City and there yeah. was a, a Serbian player there and uh, and I was still only 16 and he said, uh, you're wasting your time here in Australia, semi-professional, go overseas now, I've got an agent uh, that can take you to Belgium, take you to trials, um, why don't you go? And so, you know, I said to my parents that I'd like to go overseas and my dad said, all right, let's go for a trial and we went for two weeks at, uh, it was in Belgium, Standard Liège, which is uh, part of the French-speaking part of Belgium. Mm-hmm. And um, But little did we know it was the middle of winter and it was minus seven degrees in, in December. And that was, it was horrible. But I did enough for, for those two weeks that they ended up uh, signing me on and, and I ended up staying in Belgium. And, and, and was your dad there with you the whole time or? What, what? Yeah, he, he was only with me for those two weeks. And yeah. um, and I remember at the end of the two weeks, look, he hated it. He, he hated everything about it. He hated the weather. He didn't like the people because he thought they were rude. I remember at uh, the end of uh, the time that we had at the hotel, you know, this lady only ever spoke to us in French uh, and we only could speak back in English. And then uh, my dad heard her speak, you know, uh, Italian to another customer and he, he ended up getting angry at her. He said, you know, your Italian background, you can speak Italian, you can speak English, and why did you only speak to us in, in French the whole time? You're rude, and uh, and I will never be coming back here. And, and I'm <laughs> sitting there going, seriously, Dad, you're leaving, going back to Australia, I'm yeah. coming back here to live. you got to live there. Yeah. And, and look, you know, undoubtedly, there'll be some uh, young, aspiring soccer 
you know, stars of the future listening to this podcast, you know, who are very intrigued. And, and so was I. What's the, okay, you're 16, you're old, 17. How old were you then? When yeah, you I was this? 16. Just Go before on. I turned 17. So I turned 17 in February. I moved over in December. Yeah, and what was it like? What were your teammates like? Was it very different to playing in Australia? Uh, Joe, it was, it was hard. Um, when I look back, I, yeah. I, you know, the, the actual dream and the passion about being a footballer and being professional is what got me through because I remember yeah. walking in the change room, no one would speak to you. No one really? would actually, yeah, yeah. And, and, and at the time, you know, only after about three, four months, I started to realise a few of them spoke English, but uh, right. no one would like bother to help you. Um, you know, occasionally wouldn't pass you the ball. Uh, because you're taking their spot, you know, you're taking right. a local spot. So, um, but I found it tough because I was only a kid, a mummy's boy. Yeah. You know, the only experience I had away from home was in Canberra and I had yeah. my, my mates really around yeah. me at the same yeah. age. Yeah. Um, but Everyone remember, spoke the same language, you yeah. know, you're Australian, so it's yeah. a lot easier. Yeah, that's right. I, they, they put me in an apartment that was, um, you know, part of the training complex, but uh, it was a little bit apart. And I remember that, you know, they, they took me in there, they opened the door, then, you know, when they left, they locked it. But the, I had to go out to dinner because they were preparing dinner for me at yeah. the actual restaurant of the training complex. But I couldn't get out of the house. I, I, I was locked in. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. So who do I ring? I ring my mum. No. 20,000 kilometres away. <laughs> like she's going to help me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remembered, and I was so I was so upset. I, I'm going to go about my meal. What yeah. do I do? And you know, crying, and you know, because I was a kid still. It was yeah. tough going. Yeah. yeah, you had to grow up really quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, so there you are. You're playing there for a while. For how long did you play there before you moved? What What, what league did you go to from there? Was it Serie A? Yeah, for Serie A. So I was in Belgium for two and a half years. So from yeah. there, I went to Royal Antwerp. Uh, I was there for two years, uh, and then for, at the age of about nineteen, I went to Italy in Serie A. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. You just oh yeah. I went. I went to Italy. I got to Serie A. No, but how? Someone no. Who notices you there? This is what I. This is what fascinates me about that whole process. What explain to us, you know, like like I said, it'll be budding uh, soccer stars uh, listening to this. What happens from there exactly? Yeah, so I was playing at Royal Antwerp, and and I started playing at the age of seventeen. The first yeah. team in out, but you know, I was still playing, you know, quite regular football at that age, which is quite young. Um, and then you know, that there were scouts that would come from Italy to watch, um, and then you know, agents would come. And, um, and, and I was doing pretty well. And uh, because, you know, Italian background, the, the, you know, it's the, the Italian um, teams or clubs, they, they yeah. thought, you know, he's a young, promising player. He sounds interesting. Let's go have a look at him. And, um, and then once I was, you know, playing on a regular basis for all Antwerp, they decided to come and get me. And uh, it was a team called Cremonese who was in the Serie A. Yeah. It was halfway through the season. So they were, they were down the bottom and they just needed it. And you know, an injection of something, and they decided to get me. Yeah, right. And and can I ask you, when you get there, what was that like? What, what was the money like? What were the players like? You know, was was it a big deal for you then? Yeah. So it was a big deal. The money that I was earning in in Belgium was nothing. It was right. virtually enough to to live off of. Right. Um, and then you know, when I went to Italy, yeah, it was a bit more, but it was it was nothing that you go. It was massive money, you know, because I was still quite young. And yeah. for me, the money wasn't important at mm -hmm. that time. It was about developing as a player. It was about getting to an, another level, yeah. um, making a name for myself. So when I went, first went to Italy, it was, uh, you know, it was the best league in the world at that stage. Yeah. I was playing in a small side that was struggling yeah. for relegation, yeah. but it was the best league in the world. And, and I started off really well. So, you know, I, I scored on my debut. And, um, you that know, was going to be my question. So you scored on your day. That must have been great feeling. Yeah, it was great. It was. It was actually with my first touch. It was after about three minutes, and um, <laughs> you know, it was it was a big thing because the team hadn't won for a while. Then I scored, and then all of a sudden there was a lot of publicity about you know this young Australian's come to Italy and he's scoring goals, and um, that was good. But then when I didn't do so well, yeah. you know, because I was supposed to be, you know, one of their big stars, yeah. you know, that's when I started to cop it. And, and I wasn't ready 
for that criticism at that time. You know, so what, what was, sort of what you, you what sort of things would happen when you get abused when you're walking oh, on the street? What? Yeah, if you get abused, so over there it doesn't matter what team you play for. Normally, say Cremonese is yeah. uh, is a, a team from Cremona. Mm-hmm. It's only like a hundred thousand people that live in that town, yeah. but that's the only team, and you're living in that city. And yeah. so everyone knows who you are. So as soon as you walk out the door, people yeah. know who you are. Yeah. And right. um, when the team's not doing well um, and you're, you're fighting relegation, you have to remember, if, if they stay in Serie A, yeah. normally they'll have a team like Juventus, AC Milan, Inter Milan come along to town. Yeah. So that boosts the whole economy of the actual town. Right. Uh, and if you get relegated, you have lesser size, mainly from Calabria or, or from yeah. you know Sicily that don't yeah. travel up. Yeah. And so you know the bars, the restaurants, the the normal like economy is, is a lot less, and so they lose a lot of money. So who they're going to take it out on? They take it out on you know the players, right? Um, and also they, they take it out on the foreigners more so than the locals. So um, you know the, the papers write bad stories about you and you know that he's rubbish and you know you should go back to australia and and so as soon as you walk out the door you're getting abused and uh, and so that was that was hard because you can't even go for a walk with your wife or you can't go for you know to get a gelati with yeah. your, your, your teammates because you're going to get abused when you're doing well it's a bit different yeah <laughs> right. yeah they're giving you gelatos and and yeah, they're coming right. come into the restaurant so that's yeah. very interesting see a lot of people wouldn't know that because most people think, oh, you know, you get abused if, if, you, if you start sort of playing not so well. But a lot of people don't realise that it, 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 for, for a team like Cremonese, it, it, it actually affects the economy. Because yeah. we don't really have that in Australia, do we? No. no. And, and, and I mean, the European and UK supporters are nothing like the Australian supporters. Uh, what, what fascinates me is that, um, you know, we go to watch the AFL here in Melbourne. You know, we could be at the pub with, you know, Collingwood and... and Carlton supporters, you know, in the same pub, go to watch the game. Whoever wins, wins. Doesn't matter the outcome. We go back to the pub and we can drink together again. That doesn't happen in Europe or, or the UK. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it depends, of course, on what teams. And, and, you know, there's some teams that get along. There's some teams that have got good history together and the supporters like each other. But there's a lot of teams that hate each other. And you're right, there has to be police escort you know, in yeah. for the, the away supporters. Yeah. And sometimes they have to keep them in the stadium for about an hour or two hours and right. then escort them back to the, either their buses or to the train station. So it's, uh, it can get quite... Uh, of, at times, I experienced that there was violence in the stadium. Yeah. Um, and, you know, also I heard about violence on the street, um, you know, that close to the stadium from, yeah. you know, the opposition supporters. Yeah. Um, but then it starts to, to clean up quite a bit, but still right. they hate each other. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're losing to a certain team, you know, you, your supporters will take it out on you. Um, and I remember getting police escorted out of the stadium because we we're just getting abused from our own supporters. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they get upset here in Australia, but I don't think they'd be, you know, they'd need a police escort. You no. Know, play, no. No. And, you- and and so here we are, you're playing in Serie A. So obviously now you're going to start playing against uh, uh, heroes of yours, right? But what was that like? That would be fascinating to, yeah. to have that experience. You know what? It was um, once you walk out onto the pitch, you're, mm-hmm. you're, it, it doesn't matter who you're playing against. You're just right. trying to win a football game. But, yeah. you know, uh, at first when you're looking in the, in the tunnel when you're walking out, and yeah. you, you know, you're seeing Franco Beresi, uh, you know, Paolo Maldini, Roberto right. Baggio, you know, they're, they're players that you, you grew up watching. and, and they're, they're, I, I grew up watching those players. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So they, they were big stars and, um, you know, they were, they were such good players. And, you know, they, uh, I remember after one game, um, we played Inter Milan and um, after the game, we, we walk out to go to the car and a few yeah. of the players are, you know, either getting stopped by press or, yeah. you know, you're talking to, you know, your teammates and there's opposition um, players and I was talking to my teammate and then opposition player Giuseppe Bergami yeah. who, who won the 82 World Cup with Italy he was only yeah. 18 yeah. Um, I remember he looked 32 he had this moustache at that stage when he was uh, yeah. 18 years old and he's standing there and he just lights up a smoke and starts to smoke <laughs> 
And I've gone, oh, I was six years old watching this guy win a World Cup and now I'm standing with him and he's having a smoke next to me. It was, it was quite funny to see. Yeah. And did you, did you, like, did you end up becoming friends with some of these heroes of yours? Or like, did you ever like go out to, you know, oh, geez, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm having dinner with Budge or, or whoever. I don't know. Did any of that kind of stuff happen? Oh, not really, because yeah. you know they lived in different cities. Uh, yeah. There was occasionally that you would be at a, a restaurant or, yeah. or you know a bar, and and it would be at the same place as them. Yeah. Um, but it was not like old mates of mine or anything like that. Yeah. You know, you, you in Australia. I mean, because obviously you played after in, in, in Australia. The, the vibe between the players, between the the legends over there, versus players that you know. Well, you know, we're in the team, but weren't as popular. Was it a real, were they a real elite? Were they like rock stars? Did, did they, did people treat them? Did, did you have to treat them differently? What was that like? Um, oh, we, we didn't have to treat them differently, but they were rock stars. Like yeah. when you're talking about, um, you know, those sort of players that I'm just yeah. mentioning, yeah. or even, you know, David Beckham when I was in yeah. Spain at Real Madrid and, you know, all these guys, you, you just notice that they've, they've entered the room because there's just a swarm of people, a swarm of press. Yeah. Um, girls? You know, well, I don't know because I didn't go out at the, the same time yeah. as them, but right. I'm sure there yeah. would have been girls that yeah. were after. Yeah. Um, but it, it was just, and then there was a story in the paper. There's a, in England, the, the tabloids used to, you know, because I remember going, um, you know, out with a couple of my teammates and one of them was quite... You know, he was becoming quite famous, and there was a there was a story about him going with a girl, mm. and, she, and she was taking photos while she was at his house, um, and showing what you know his house looked like from the inside, and it was mm. back page of uh, you know one mm. of the Sunday papers, and and yeah. I just thought you know that's you have to really at that stage yeah. those players had to be careful what they did. Yeah. Okay. So you're playing for Cremonese. You've done well there. Is, is okay. That, Okay. okay. Yeah. So oh, you know what? I would say that I didn't do that well because, right. uh, you know, the team didn't do well, but then personally, I wasn't having a, a great time. So I got, uh, we got relegated uh, yeah. from Serie A to Serie B and then Serie yeah. B to Serie C. Right. And, um, and so it was a tough period, you know, because it was, it was full on, like I said, with the, the supporters, with the, the whole uh, city itself. Um, and from there, I didn't really want to play Serie C and uh, Terry Venables, who was our coach of the national team was also the chairman of a team in England called Portsmouth that were in the championship. Right. And so that's why you ended up going to, to sport Portsmouth. Yeah. That's why I ended up going to Portsmouth. Yeah. I looked at it and I go, yes, I would rather be playing in Serie A or in the Premier League, yeah. but sometimes you need to take a step back yeah. to go forwards again. I needed to regain my confidence. I needed to right. play more football, start scoring yeah. goals again. Yeah. And it was an opportunity for me to do that. Okay, so talk us through what happened next. So when I went to Portsmouth, it was it was good because yep. you know it was a it was a new start for me. Yep. The, the the actual um, the championship was a good league to play in. It was a tough league, but it was end to end. In Italy, when as a striker, you don't get a lot of chances to score goals, and yep. uh, in England, it was a lot more open. So I was getting opportunities to score. And that's because it's a different game, right? Yeah, different play, game. Yeah. It, 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 and also the supporters were different. When the supporters mm -hmm. saw you trying, yep. they applauded you. Whereas in Italy, they don't care if you're trying or not. If you're not scoring goals or you're not winning games, they don't care how much you're running or yeah. how, you know, how much you care. Yeah. Whereas in England, it was a bit different. In England, they saw how much you were working for the team. They, they would actually support you through that. Yeah. Um, and it was going well until Terry Venables ended up leaving. And there was quite a few other Australians there with us. Mm -hmm. And um, the new owner came in, a new coach came in, and he wanted to get rid of all the Australians. And he did get rid of all of them except me. But he told me that I could leave in the off-season. And um, he said, you know, don't come back. If you do come back, you're going to be number seventh striker in line. And then um, and I was like, oh. So, you know, I looked to see where else I could go. There was nothing really else available for me. So yeah. I decided to stick it out in that pre-season and work for my spot. And uh, and so I stayed. And then from there, you went to La Liga? No. No. So, so from there, I, I, at Portsmouth, I ended up um, doing really well under the coach that didn't want me. Um, yeah. And uh, within six months, I'd scored 17 goals, um, which was quite a lot uh, yeah. for that short period. I went there to the Premier League side, Coventry. Oh, City. Coventry, yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I was there for, for two and a half years. And 
Um, but it ended up having a pretty bad injury during that period at Coventry. I was out for a year, which was, was really tough for me. So why then did you go to La Liga? Did, did you end up uh, uh, overcoming your injuries and doing well again? Yes. Yeah, I ended up overcoming my injury, but uh, it was quite fortunate. There was a, it was a tough, that was again, you know, there's there's certain periods in your career, Joe, that you, um, you know, lack of form you can deal with because you've always got the opportunity that next game um, to, to try and put it right, um, you know, and your confidence, you can you regain your confidence quite quickly. Yeah. But uh, when you've got an injury and you don't know when you're going to be able to return, that's when you start to go through a little bit of a, a depressive state. You know, there was times that you don't know whether you're going to be able to play again. Um, and so, but it was a time where I could reflect as well because, uh, you know, on your own game, uh, on, you know, people start to forget you quickly from being someone that's in the public eye and being popular to being someone that doesn't really, you know, no one remembers. So I start to think, oh, this is what it's like when you retire. People forget yeah, about right. you quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But once I eventually got back, I was a lot stronger as a character and um, and my game had developed a little bit different because I, I had to change my running gait because of my injury. Um, so my games changed a little bit and um, I was playing well and uh, a Spanish side, uh, Osasuna, uh, decided to take a, a punt and, and sign me to go over to La Liga. Yeah, and as, at this point, is in this is where you start making serious money when you start to go into the Premier League at La Liga? Yeah, in the Premier League is when I started to earn uh, good money. Um, I'd say before that, it was okay. Yeah. Um, you know... You know, when I first started in Belgium, you know, I'll be honest with you, it was like earning forty thousand dollars a year. Right. Um, and then, you know, eventually it started to go up a little bit in Italy, but not a great deal. In the Championship was okay, but in the Premier League is when I started to, to earn money to say, okay, this is this is going to set me up for after when I retire. And and as the same in La Liga. So it, yeah. it took, I would say, probably a good five, six years before I started to, to earn real money. Yeah, and, and what were the other guys? There would have been guys earning a lot more money than you probably at the same time. What what what, what were some of the extra... I mean, I love this kind of rock star stuff, right? Yeah. You know, what, let, tell us about that, because a lot of people don't never never know about those kind of... What were the other guys doing? Were they just splurging all the time, restaurants, uh, cars, yeah. holidays? What was that like? Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it's fascinating, because you walk into a place and straight yeah. away you're getting judged on what clothes you're wearing. You know, right. if, you're not, if you're not wearing, uh, you know, Dolce Gabbana or Versace yeah. or yeah. whatever else, and yeah. even if you are, they'll, 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 you know, make fun of you if it wasn't good. Um, right. and then, or last season's fashion. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got your, the, the, the car park, uh, you know, the, there's, um, the clubs that I was at wasn't too bad, but you still yeah. have your Porsches, your Mercedes, you know, yeah. your whatever cars. And, and people would make judgment on, you know, mm. whatever cars you had. But I, I remember having some teammates that would, you know, change car every three months, uh, buy a new car, drive it out of the garage, which would lose bloody yeah. nearly 50% yeah. of its yeah. value, yeah. Yeah. and then sell it and then go get another car. And, you know, quite a few players wasted a lot of money, you know, uh, go buy a million pound house, uh, you know, after their first new contract. And you're right. going, a million pound back then is, yeah. you know, that was huge money. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're just thinking, you can see it coming if you don't have good guidance. Yeah. And I was lucky I come from, you know, a dad that you know was quite uh he used to educate us and, and yeah. you know tell us you know uh, you earn this money yes you can uh, spend it a, a little bit but you have to save and you have to invest and you have yeah. to and so w when i was starting to earn good money i enjoyed it but i still invested a lot back in uh adelaide and yeah. um but a lot of these players now i look back and and hear about it you know, a lot of them lost the majority of their money because yeah. of their lifestyle. It's a shame, really, isn't it? And I think you're right. It's because of where we came from that we had that. You know, well, look, I, I remember when I first bought my first sports car, I had the money. I could have bought it. But I had no house because I'd lived overseas yeah. for so long. i just come back to Australia. Uh, and even overseas, I didn't drive around. We always had people driving us or hire cars. Yeah. So I've come back to Australia. Right, I need, some, I need a set of wheels. I can afford a nice car. But I didn't have a house yet. So I was too embarrassed to buy a new car because I know my dad would have said to me, what are you doing? 
Yeah. What, what are you driving in this car? You haven't even got a house. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> so I had to, I, before I had my first sports car, I had to buy the house. Then the next week I went and bought the, then I went and bought the car, you know. And it's because that, of that same thing. And we're lucky, I suppose, that we had that upbringing because, you know, today, otherwise you'd be in the same position as the other guys, right? Yeah. You know, and, and look, I'm not against um, people enjoying their money, but, yeah. you know, because when you've got it, you also want to like, you know, give yourself a present. So yeah, you sure. car because because you yeah. think, well, I, I've earned this. I, I'm earning this money. It's not like yeah. oh, they, someone just given it to me. It's yeah. something that I worked hard for and, and yeah. whatever else. But you're right, my, my old man. You know, if I bought a, a car, how much does that cost? Yeah. You yeah. know, can't you invest that money? Yeah. You know, that's bad. <laughs> I just you are, you're a soccer star all over the world, but, <laughs> but no. You know, yeah. it was it was like I, I did a concert recently. It was on my twentieth anniversary. I sold out the Enmore Theatre in, in Sydney. You know, it's about 2,000 seater and, you know, bar. We're doing, the, the, we're recording a DVD. Uh, uh, and all he could say was, at the Enmore, where are people going to park? That's, that's all he yeah. cared about. <laughs> like, what do you mean? We sold out. That's all Don't you're worry worried about. where people going to park. What about I'll get there. <laughs> You know, you got to love him for that, you know. Yeah, no, you do. And, yeah. and another thing that my dad, you know, he, he drove into us, you know, um, even about gambling, you know, there's people yeah. that, that gamble a lot of money away. And yeah. then I remember some of these bus trips that these these players, because we used yeah. to like, travel, say, from um, one place to another. It would take us seven hours sometimes yeah. on a bus. Right. And you get bored and what do people do? They play cards and start betting big money and, you know. You well, with each it. other. They play, they yeah. bet against each other. Yeah. yeah. And... Yeah. and, and and if you lose that money, the person that wins it is not going to feel sorry for you. They're taking that money. So, yeah. you know, I, I remember playing with one player down at Portsmouth. He was, um, he, he had earned a lot of money, yeah. uh, but he was, he was a very big gambler. And um, I remember one day he turned up in his, uh, it was an old Commodore. It was called a Vauxhall. Uh, and uh, he, he goes, Johnny, come over here, have a look at this. He opened up his boot yeah. and he had a bag in there and he had at least 50 grand full of cash in that bag. He goes, right. I, I won it yesterday. <laughs> and then um, he comes the next day and he had a brand new Porsche. And I go, oh, did you spend? He goes, no, no, the bookie owed me money. So he, he gave me his Porsche. And then uh, two days later, he turned back with his Vauxhall, the, the, the Commodore. <laughs> and I go, what happened? He goes, I lost the last bet. <laughs> And then, you know, you hear a story that, you know, he, he lost over a million pounds uh, during his playing career uh, just through gambling, you know, through wow. horse racing, through cars, yeah. through yeah. all of that stuff. And, and you know, I was fortunate that my dad said, you know, you have to remember that there's no problem in gambling, but don't gamble, you know, something that you haven't got. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. if you want to, uh, you know, put a bet on something, put it, but it's for fun, you yeah. know, not, not to the, for an income. Because, not an income, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you work hard for that money, you don't want to lose it. Yeah. Okay, going back to your career, um, before I, I want because I want to move on to to what happened in Australia. Um, so you finished up in uh, 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 you finished up in, in Coventry City, and then you went to La Liga for a while. You were there for how many years? I was there for six years in Spain, and yeah. and and I loved it. That, that was yeah. probably the where I enjoyed my football the most. Probably I was a little bit more mature as a as a mm -hmm. player, as a person. Yeah. Um, but I love the, the, the football, the lifestyle, um, the, the people. And my three girls were born in Spain. And so it was a, it was, it was right. a really good time. Uh, yeah. and, and the team that I was playing in did quite well at yeah. that stage as well. Yeah. And so you were lucky you had uh, your wife, uh, Angela, along with you most of the ride, which is, which is also probably very important as to why, you know, it keeps you stable, right? Because a lot of these guys would have just... You know, no, no family, no, no grounding. It's a much. It's very easy to go off with different girls every week and losing your money here and there. No one's going to rein you in. So I'm sure she yeah. had a big play to, part to play in that, right? Massive part, massive yeah. part to play. She's an Adelaide girl, um, yeah. Italian background. Yeah. So similar upbringings, and it, it made it easier because <laughs> you know marriage is important. That. Uh, yeah, it's never easy to have your, you know, your ups and downs as well yeah. in marriage. But yeah. you know, if you've got things in common, and she, she was a stabilizer because, I, again, I'll go back to some of the teammates that I had. You can understand they're home by themselves. Mm. They've got all the money in the world. Yeah, they're bored. What yeah. do you do? You know, yeah. go get a tattoo, go to the pub, 
go, you know, uh, it, just different things and different girls throw themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's teammates that had two, three different wives. Um, it's yeah. just, it, it, it's hard, you know, yeah. to, to have a, that stable sort of yeah. grounding yeah. if you're going home to nothing sometimes. Yeah. So then you come to Australia. You come to Australia and you pay for the uh, play for the Gold Coast Mariners, right? Central Coast Mariners. Central Coast Mariners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> my, right. uh, uh, you know, I, I was doing a lot of touring back then. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to watch a lot of sport. That's where I first met you was when yeah. I was in Perth playing for the Central Coast Mariners. You that's were doing right. the show. That's and, right. Um, and we were in a club you. afterwards. Yeah, that's and, right. And I, I looked at you and I thought, I know this guy. And I think I came up to you and I said, uh, it was a great moment because I come up to you and I said, uh, are you the guy that scored the goal that got Australia into the World Cup? And you said, oh, yeah, you might not recognise. I think then you pulled your shirt over your head. And you... <laughs> I don't think I pulled my shirt over my head. <laughs> and you said, now do you recognise me? Something like, I can't, just say you did, John, just for the joke. <laughs> People will look at me and go, "What's this guy talking about?" <laughs> but uh, look, it, yeah. it was, it was, yeah. I, I came back to Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, it was good to play back uh, in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, things went quite well at Central yeah. Coast. So we made the, we won the Premier's Plate, so we finished top in the normal yeah. regular season. Yeah. And then we made the Grand Final. We ended up losing that to Newcastle Jets. Um, and then from there, I moved on to Sydney FC, where things at the start didn't go quite that yeah. well for me and for yeah. the team yeah right and then uh, uh what, what year did you finish and when did, when did you start going to go into coaching i finished back in uh 2011 beginning mm -hmm. of 2011 february so and then i straight away went into coaching into the youth team at melbourne heart so yeah i, I played sydney fc for two years um the second year at sydney fc went quite well we won the, yeah. the grand final we um and then went to melbourne heart and, yeah. and i knew with the way my body was and, and the injuries i had that was going to be my last year um at playing and um you know come back from pretty serious injury uh, um operation on my hamstring and knee operation but worked my way back into to getting fit enough to finish off my career yeah and then um once I finished, I went straight into uh, coaching the youth team at Melbourne Heart yeah. because I already had in my head that I wanted to be a coach. I started doing all my my licenses, um, and, and and so yeah, I stepped into that. and And I'd be the youth team, but I'd also be working with the first team, which was uh, which was good. It was a good experience for me. Um, then after a year, I ended up getting the the first team job at Melbourne Heart. Yeah. Now, I always, it always fascinates me. I mean, I've been getting into AFL a lot since I moved to Melbourne. And I know that because I didn't really grow up with AFL, I grew up with rugby in Sydney. So I didn't know a lot of the coaches who, who, who coach the, the teams here. I didn't know because I was not never here. I never knew that they were players. And it never occurred to me that most of the coaches here actually played once upon a time. Is that the same with soccer? It is the same. You still get coaches that didn't play at a high level that yeah. uh, that that coach at a high level. Uh, but the majority of um, of coaches have played at a certain level, and and the reason why it, it does help, you know, I'm not saying that it's the be all and end all because mm. you can still coach at a higher level, like mm. Jose Mourinho, and and had it played at that level. Right. But the, 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 but what helps you is that you know your experiences as a player. You know, you, you can relate to the players uh, because you've been in their position. Um, so you can draw on those experiences, you know. So a, a, a lot of um, ex-players doesn't mean they're going to be good coaches, but it, it gives them a little bit of a head start sometimes. Yeah. Did you always know that you were going to be a coach one day? Is that where you really wanted to go? Uh, when I was playing in Spain, I ended up having a, a good coach. He was a Mexican guy and, and his assistant was, was really good that I got along well with. And that's when I started to think about coaching and, and start yeah. to think, you know what, I, I wouldn't mind coaching at the end of my career. And, uh, and I started to take an interest in that and, and what they were doing and how it worked, how it didn't work and, you know, yeah. what they would say, team talks, you know, how they treat certain individuals because yeah. there's a lot more to coaching than just tactics, you know. Yeah. There's, 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 a, there's a mental side of things. So there's dealing with the media, there's dealing with the hierarchy, uh, which are your owners or your board members yeah. or whatever else. Um, yeah. So th there's, there's a lot that comes into play. Yeah, and speaking of that, uh, I, I mean, uh, so so you went to uh, after after uh, Melbourne Heart, you went to uh, Brisbane, right? And you yeah. coached there for a while. Yeah. But what I want to focus on is what happened in Melbourne because I remember 
I think I remember watching the game. It wasn't on, it wasn't live. I, I was on TV, and you were getting booed by by the by the the fans, yeah. telling you to leave. Yeah. What what was that like? What what effect did that have on you personally and, and your family? Um, look, personally, I could deal with it because mm-hmm. personally, I knew the situation that I was going into. Yeah. You know, Melbourne Heart had um, from the year previous to the when I was coaching, they had cut their budget back a million dollars. Right. But, um, you know, so when I got into the role, it was uh, it wasn't the team or the club; it was the year before. So um, I knew it was going to take a bit of time to to build that team up again. So you can you can actually deal with it, and you know what you're trying. As long as you got the players behind you, which I had the group, that you'd get through these tough situations. But I had no one really supporting me in the in the public eye to say mm-hmm. this is what we're doing as a club. This is where we're heading. Um, so the fans, who do they go for? They go for the person front and center, and that was me at the time. I was the head coach, so I started to. Um, I was okay, but my family suffered a lot. You know, right. my, my, my youngest daughter was going through, you know, anxiety because all she could hear was, you know, the, the fans screaming Aloisi out, you know, you know, get rid of him, you know, we want him out of the club and, you know, booing me whenever my face came on the screen. And that's tough for a young kid, you know. Yeah. It's, um, well, it's, it's tough for you. It's tough for, for an adult to deal with that, let alone, yeah. you know, how old was your daughter at that, at that stage? At that stage, should have been about, um, I think, about eight. eight yeah, that's old. tough. Yeah. yeah. And so when yeah. I'd see, you know, when I'd come home and I'd see her mm. crying and, and whatever else, you know, that was tough. So mm. I had to explain to all my daughters, um, you know, look, th- th- this is what coaching is about. You're going to mm-hmm. go through situations like this. Yeah. It was the same with playing. You, you know, you, you have your difficult moments and then yeah. you have your moments. The ones people only see when you succeed. I yeah. don't see when you know you're going through a yeah. tough situation, the yeah. failure or whatever, or they do see it, but they they don't realise what it takes to get to that, that when you're going to yeah. succeed. You don't just yeah. wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you go and win the World Cup. Yeah, you know, there's things that happen in the process. Yeah, and um, and I always believe that you learn a lot from when you're going through a tough period, and and I learned uh, a lot about myself. And um, and and also I learned what I had to do next time I stepped into a football club. What I you know yeah. what it was going to be like. So it was a tough time, but you know it was an experience that I I felt that was going to help me grow as a, as a person and also as a coach. Yeah, and and then you went to uh, Brisbane Raw. Yeah. Oh, I got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one right. And you were there for a couple of seasons, right? I was there for three and a half years, still the longest serving coach of Brisbane Raw. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the first season we were one point off of winning uh, the championship. We, yeah. uh, you know, the last game of the season, we drew with Melbourne victory. If we'd won, we would have won the title. Yeah. And then we played an epic semi final against Wanderers where we lost 5 4 in extra time. Um, and the second season, we, we did well again. We finished third, we made the semi final again. Um, at that time, we lost to Melbourne Victory, who went on to win it. Uh, yeah. The third season, we made finals again, um, and and then the the the, the third and like the, after in the fourth season, things weren't going so well. But I, from past experiences, I should have actually realised what was happening within the club. Um, that you know, I'd been fighting uh, for the players for the club for for a long period because. You know, when I first stepped into Brisbane Raw, the, the players hadn't been paid their super for over a year. You know, there were certain people within the club that hadn't been paid. And I was helping them and protecting them. Then I got to three years down the track and I go in to see, you know, the hierarchy of the mm. club and, um, and say, you know, what do you want to do with this club? Do you want to, do, how do you want it to go forward? Do you want to win? Do you want... And they said, yeah, we want to win. I said, well, if you want to win, this is what other clubs are doing. This is what other clubs are spending. Mm-hmm. This is their infrastructure that they have. Oh, no, no, no. We, you know, we want to do less than what we've done in the past and still be successful. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, yeah. it, it can happen. It can work for one year, but then yeah. it's, it's not sustainable. And, um, yeah. and I think the fight sort of started to go and the yeah. players, the, the fight of the players started to go. Yeah. And, so we, we struggled in, in that first period in, in my fourth season and I could see that the, the situation in the club wasn't changing, so yeah. I decided to leave. But um, 
in hindsight, I should have left right at the end of the third season because mm. we performed really well for three years. Yeah. I'm glad you, you pointed that out because a lot of people actually don't see that side of it, do they? They no. just see uh, teams not doing well. There's a lot of pressure from the fans, but they don't know that it's just not the team that's not doing well. It's a, it's a hierarchy, as you say. And it's very, very important to be involved in, a, in an organisation where uh, you feel like you're a family. I mean, uh, um, as you know, a, a, a couple of days ago, um, we lost Michael Gudinski. In our business, he was, you know, he's the godfather of Australian music. And with all the, um, all the people, the outpouring of grief, the, the thing that people said the most was he, he looked after us. Jimmy Barnes would say he looked after us. Um, Nick Chester from, from Jet would say, you know, he, he, he was the best part of, of, my, of my job. And it's very, very important to have that. And when you don't have that, you can see why things like this happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and I agree. Look, you know, the thing is um, yeah, important in not only in, uh, in a football club, but in any environment, you have to have a home. And we'd change our training grounds in seven, eight times in those three years. Uh, you know, we had different offices and, you know, um, and, and so there's not that stability within the club. And, you know, the players realised what I was trying to achieve. But, uh, you know, eventually the players start losing that fight for the club because they're thinking, well, nothing's been changing here. Nothing's improving. So, you know, I, I still believe that, um, you know, to, to create a good club, you have to have stability from the top. If you've got that from the top, then it, it actually creates stability through the whole club. 